Quantum of Solace is the worst James Bond movie ever made, a film that learned all the wrong lessons from Casino Royale and generally a betrayal of the series. I was a bit surprised by the amount of pushback I got for this take. While I was fully prepared for my Skyfall criticisms to draw some ire, I didn't expect there'd be many Quantum Defenders. To be fair, objections were a lot less Quantum is actually good so much as they were Quantum isn't the worst Bond movie, and I get that. Movies like Diamonds Are Forever or The Man with the Golden Gun are much more outlandish in their badness and general stupidity, but I'd also argue these movies offer a lot more as entertainments. Few of the Bond movies really qualify as great, but all of the films, even the weakest ones, usually have at least one standout element. Whether it be a fun action scene or some good music, a memorable performance, even just a single stunt. Part of 007's longevity comes from how reliably the franchise delivers the goods of escapist spectacle. Diamonds Are Forever is a perfect example of this, a largely terrible movie which nonetheless features an awesome John Barry score, a nail-bitingly claustrophobic fight scene, and an all-timer title track from the indelible Shirley Bassey. I'd never call the movie good, hell I'd barely call it competent, but looked at for its individual components, Diamonds does offer some value. But what does Quantum of Solace offer? The main theme is dreadful, while both it and the opening titles are hopelessly generic and don't really reflect the film at all. The action scenes are an incoherent mess of quick cuts and disorienting close-ups, which don't communicate what's happening. Matthew Almerich seems completely checked out as the film's villain. And oh yeah, the film is an overbearingly self-serious slog of misery. Most of the best performances come from returning players like Daniel Craig and Judi Dench. As far as good things that are unique to Quantum of Solace, uh, I like it when M says this. When someone says we've got people everywhere, you expect it to be hyperbole. Lots of people say that. Florists use that expression. It doesn't mean that they've got somebody working for them inside the bloody room. But that's mostly it. However, I will concede, there is one James Bond movie worse than Quantum of Solace. Never, never say never again. Sort of. See, it's not really a James Bond movie. But before I spend way too much time ranting about why I don't like a James Bond movie, let's talk about today's sponsor, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of classes in all manner of subjects. Filmmaking, writing, fine art, web design, entrepreneurship. Whatever you're looking for, they've got it. If you watch my videos, you may well be interested in making video essays of your own and don't know where to start. Well, I'd highly recommend Halis Narvaez's class, Learn Premiere Pro and Edit a How-To Video for Beginners. As someone who largely learned editing by myself, troubleshooting through issues and mistakes as they came up, I cannot stress enough how much time this class would have saved me. Skillshare is also ad-free and costs less than $10 a month with an annual subscription. And if you'd rather try it first before spending some dough, then good news. The first 1,000 people who click the link in the description will get a free trial of Skillshare's premium membership. Whether you're a pro looking to sharpen your skills or a novice striking up a new hobby, Skillshare has got you covered. Never Say Never Again may be adapted from one of Ian Fleming's James Bond novels. It may feature several Bond characters, including 007 himself, played by the immortal Sean Connery, no less. But it isn't a James Bond movie. I mean this in both a legal sense, given the film was not produced by Eon Productions and therefore not an official entry within the James Bond series, but also in a more essential way. So much of Bond's identity is rooted in uniquely cinematic tropes. The gun barrel intro, the main theme, the title sequences, that are not used in Never Say Never Again. The result is a strange facsimile of James Bond, one clearly reminiscent and evocative of the real Bond, but also distinctly unreal. The feeling is not unlike being a Bloodborne or Dark Souls fan and going to play something like Neo. It's clear what the work is trying to be, but it's no substitute for the real McCoy. The 
The story of how this strange Bondian outlier came to be could fill its own video, but to give the Cliff Notes version, in 1959, Ian Fleming worked with filmmaker Kevin McClory on a screenplay for an original James Bond movie built around underwater battles, plane hijacking, the evil organization Spectre, and the stealing of atomic bombs. That film never materialized, but when Fleming published the novel Thunderball two years later, McClory noticed some similarities and sued for plagiarism, ultimately winning the film rights to the novel. McClory did work with Bond producers Harry Saltzman and Cubby Broccoli on the 1965 film adaptation of Thunderball, with the condition McClory not produce his own version for 10 years. Come the mid-70s though, McClory began working on his own adaptation, and after spending several years in development hell, Never Say Never Again would finally hit theaters in 1983, the same year as Eon's official Bond entry, Octopussy. And perhaps the craziest thing about this whole ordeal is it's not even the first time it happened to James Bond. A similar rights snafu led to producer Charles K. Feldman making an unofficial adaptation of Casino Royale in 1967, the same year Eon released You Only Live Twice. Of course, Feldman opted to make his unofficial 007 movie a zany spoof of James Bond, clearly distinct from the main series. Even someone completely blind to the various rights issues would no doubt realize that this Casino Royale wasn't a real Bond movie. Never Say Never Again was different. This is a film that wanted to compete as a legitimate Bond adventure, one which would rival the best of Eon, and McClory assembled a hell of a team to realize that vision. Irvin Kirshner, fresh off The Empire Strikes Back, was tapped to direct, with Indiana Jones DP Douglas Slocomb working as cinematographer. The musical genius behind Jacques Demy's masterpieces, Michel Legrand, was hired to compose an original score. To play the villainous Emile Largo, the filmmakers turned to esteemed character actor Klaus Maria Bronde, who'd recently scored an international triumph with the Oscar-winning Mephisto. And speaking of casting coups, the producers even managed to snag the most iconic James Bond of all. Sean Connery had previously declared he'd never again play 007, but now would return to the character he made an icon. What could be better than that? How about Max von Sydow as Blofeld? Shut up and take my money! All the pieces were in place for McClory to blow Eon right out of the water. That didn't happen. Both Never Say Never Again and Octopussy received comparably lukewarm reviews, and though McClory scored the better opening weekend, Octopussy ultimately outgrossed Never Say Never Again to the tune of about 12 million. Frankly, it's a testament to Sir Sean Connery's charisma that Never Say Never Again performed as well as it did, because the movie is terrible. Bill's quick capsule review, piece of shit. I realize this is an incredibly subjective opinion that the film has its fans, but I've never been able to get behind it. Before I get into my Bond-rooted critiques, I should stress that the film largely fails on its own terms. Consider the very first sequence, where Michel Legrand's breezy title track is haphazardly slapped over the opening action scene. It's hard to know what the tone's supposed to be when Bond's infiltration is built on these really violent murders, and they're all offset by this mellow listening. Of course, the twist is this scene is actually a training exercise, and Bond isn't actually in real danger. But wouldn't that revelation land better if the scene had a greater sense of intensity? Speaking of music, Legrand's whole score just feels consistently off. The man had an amazing flair for writing longing romance and boundless joy, but action thrillers were evidently not his foray. There are more fundamental issues here though, like how Largo is so laid back and unassuming that it's hard to find him menacing. Domino doesn't even seem to dislike him much either, to the point that it makes her eventual rebellion against him a lot less powerful. The dude's a bit of a goon and a bit violent and dangerous at times, but he certainly doesn't match well against 007. 
Speaking of which, Connery plays Bond with such a thick layer of ironic detachment that he doesn't seem to much care about anything going on in the film. Consequently, while there is a lot of action throughout, most of it is lacking in tension. Take the scene where Bond is held at gunpoint by Fatima Blush, who in this version has been reduced from a sexy villainess equal to Bond to a crazy lady who just hates men, but whatever. Bond's technically in trouble, but Connery plays it so smug and the script has him repeatedly unnerve Fatima that there's never any suspense. Bond is always in control. Why should I be afraid for him? Then he blows Fatima up and he and Felix have a laugh about the whole thing. The movie is too in awe of Connery, unwilling to place its hero in any sort of genuine peril, which makes for a pretty inert action movie. Never Say Never Again also fails for the same reason a lot of remakes fail, unflattering comparisons to the original. Scene after scene only serve to echo how much better Thunderball was 20 some years ago. Take the murder of Domino's brother. In Thunderball, it's this really ominous moment where an uncanny doppelganger brutally shoots the brother at point-blank range, the low lighting further contributing to the eerie mood. In Never Say Never Again, we get this ridiculous bit of slapstick. In Thunderball, Bond humiliates Largo in a game of Baccarat. In Never Say Never Again, Bond humiliates Largo at... Major League Gaming! I like to imagine, if this movie were made today, Bond and Largo would 1v1 in Dark Souls. Well, Mr. Bond, it appears you've cost me my souls. Get good, you filthy casual. But the best example is the scene where Bond confides to Domino that her brother has been killed by Largo. In Thunderball, this is a surprisingly vulnerable scene, with Bond revealing a great deal of empathy and humanity, all while maintaining the character's cold detachment. The exposition moves the plot along, but the direction suggests a deeper sorrow. In Never Say Never Again, Bond tells Domino her brother's dead during a comical dance number. Your brother's dead. Keep dancing. And apparently, Kirshner wanted this to be funny. Like, the scene where an innocent finds out her brother was murdered. I don't know, is that really the best place to go for yucks? Just because it's a dramatic scene doesn't mean you can't do a little comedy in the background. Throw a pie at two, for God's sake. But Never Say Never Again's most interesting failings are specific to its status as this strange facsimile of a James Bond movie, one which echoes the series without actually getting to be a part of it. As an adaptation of Fleming's Thunderball novel, the film follows the basic Bond formula to the letter. Bad guys steal some sort of MacGuffin that threatens the world, and my 6 agent 007 is assigned to investigate. The mission takes Bond to exotic locations full of beautiful women, as Bond does battle against the villains in a series of chases, shootouts, and fistfights, whilst also humiliating the villain in a masculine contest, even stealing his girl. This is all standard Bond stuff, as are briefing scenes with M, flirtations with Money Penny, meeting Felix Leiter on location, even getting gadgets from Q Branch but the movie lacks a lot of the stylistic hallmarks that have defined the cinematic James Bond. Missing from action are the gun barrel sequence, which had opened every Bond film since Dr. No, the iconic James Bond theme, the pre-title sequence, and the animated titles set to an original theme song. Half of these omissions are for legal reasons, with Eon owning the rights to the gun barrel and the Bond theme, which made them unusable for Never Say Never Again. The film does try to do its own riff on the gun barrel with this wall of 007 logos, but these two feel like cheap imitations of the more iconic and famous logo from Eon. The filmmakers could have created their own animated title sequence to accompany Michelle Legrand's theme song, but for whatever reason opted not to. The theme song and credits instead played non-digetically over the opening action scene. The end result is a Bond film in name only. Despite a script which comes straight from Fleming, and despite Connery himself back in the tux, 
the lack of 007's cinematic identity renders Never Say Never Again little more than an off-brand knockoff. Comparisons to Quantum of Solace are very apt, both so keen to ignore the aesthetic Bondian elements, they inadvertently reveal just how shallow the series is. Without those aesthetics, all you're left with is a generic action movie, and in the case of Never Say Never Again, a pretty poor one too. And that was inevitable. The strange legal circumstances which led to Never Say Never Again's existence in the first place meant the film could never be a traditional Bond adventure. But that's not why the film is so disappointing. What makes Never Say Never Again such a waste is that it tried to be one in the first place. Being stripped of the traditional Bondian elements is not a limitation, but an opportunity to make a Bond film freed from the albatross that is the franchise. Not being able to adhere to series traditions allows the filmmakers to make choices the official series never could. For one, James Bond could actually have an arc. The episodic nature of the Eon series means Bond can't really change too much from film to film, as he needs to remain the same reliable hero. The only arc the filmmakers can really tell is how James Bond became James Bond, which is why the Daniel Craig movies told that story three times in a row. On Her Majesty's Secret Service attempted to shift the character through offering him a happy ending before ripping it away, but then Diamonds Are Forever opened with a complete reset of the status quo. But since McClory only had the rights to Thunderball, Never Say Never Again was never gonna have sequels and that greatly expands the types of stories you can tell. Given Connery's own age, perhaps this would be a good time to give Bond something the books never did and the films never will. An ending. Arch-nemesis Blofeld is already part of the story. What better a swan song for Bond than one final battle against his greatest villain? The film could allude to a long, painful history between the two, which would evoke fans' memories of Tracy, without ever having to reference her directly. To that end, this also offers a chance to explore an aging hero. What do decades of this violent life do to a person? Never Say Never Again sort of does this by making Bond a semi-retired agent, but it's largely superficial. A couple of jokes about his age, and meta-references to spycraft getting stale in Connery's absence. I'm not saying the filmmakers should have gone full unforgiven, but a more mature James and a bit of reflection on the series' violence could have made for a pretty compelling movie. Here's another idea. Since Never Say Never Again is going to reference 007's long history as a secret agent, why not directly incorporate the character within Cold War history? Similar to how Watchmen showed how the emergence of superheroes in the 1930s changed the course of 20th century history, how would the exploits of a Bondian super spy have reshaped the Cold War? This doesn't have to be a major aspect of the plot, nor do events like the Cuban Missile Crisis need to be mentioned by name, but it could be interesting to tease out a world dramatically altered through Bond's influence. And you might think such story beats are impossible, given the filmmakers only have the rights to Thunderball and not the characters generally. But I'm not so sure about that. Feldman's Casino Royale is the loosest possible adaptation of Fleming's novel, and it still passed without a lawsuit from Eon. Fitting these narrative ideas around Thunderball's plot seems perfectly doable. But even if we accept that no major narrative deviations can be made, there is still opportunity for unique, formal choices. While the main series has largely soared with elements like spectacular production design and romantic scores, the filmmakers behind Eon's films have rarely had the freedom to experiment with the Bond aesthetic. The series look and feel has certainly evolved with time, but each era of Bond is defined by a certain in-house style, which emphasizes functionality rather than grandiose flair. But given the team behind Never Say Never Again can't fall back on classic Bondian tradition, the time is ripe for such experimentation. Even something simple like the film's aspect ratio. Instead of opting for 2.39 by 1 as essentially the default action movie aspect ratio, what if it changed throughout the film? 
to reflect how the look of Bond changed with time. Perhaps the early sections of the film are presented in the more narrow 1.66x1 aspect ratio, like the early Bond films, before shifting to a wider and more spectacular 2.39x1 in the middle. And the style of film could even shift with the aspect ratio, starting as a small-scale detective story when Bond is at the health spa, which shifts into Hitchcockian suspense, then slowly becoming a more bombastic spectacle, with extravagant scenery and large-scale action as the story moves to Nassau. And as that spectacle becomes more and more hollow, the production value can slowly slip, with the ratio slowly reverting back into 1.66x1. This isn't an exact mirror of how the Bond style evolved over time, but it's pretty close. Moreover, it's an aesthetic choice which adds a lot of texture to the story, and even acts as sly, understated critique of the main series, growing even bigger and more empty until there was nowhere to go but down. And speaking of series critiques, let's talk about Domino. Instead of just casting an up-and-coming hot actress to play the Bond girl, what if the role keeps shifting? The first time we meet her, she's played by someone close in age to Connery, but every subsequent appearance, she's played by a new, younger actress. This not only critiques the disposability of the women in Bond's life, but it also draws attention to how the Bond girl seems to get younger and younger as Bond himself continually ages. And this opens up another fun possibility. How does Bond react? Perhaps he's oblivious to the changes. Or maybe he knows something isn't right, and that every time he sees Domino, it's fundamentally a different person. Now you've really got a different kind of Bond movie. An almost surreal nightmare, where James is trapped in a world which doesn't make sense. Not that you'd even need to resort to these sorts of extreme meta-elements to distinguish the film from the main series. Given the budgetary struggles on Never Say Never Again, it might make sense to tell a more bare-bones Bond adventure, less about grandiose spectacle and humor, and more grounded, low-key thrills. Still an action movie, but one with more teeth and grit than the comic book silliness of the Eon series. Maybe reduce the number of dialogue-filled exposition scenes, and focus more on simply observing Bond operate. A more sparse, focused 007. Hell, why not shoot the movie in black and white? I realize this wasn't the most lucrative decision in the 1980s, but it immediately sets the film apart from every Bond movie prior. This might all sound hypocritical, given my criticisms of the Craig era's attempts to break from the series' traditions, but given Never Say Never Again literally can't indulge in those traditions, it does not make sense to try and masquerade as if it can. This is absolutely a case to take big, bold swings. Which is not to say I think the ideas I've laid out here are particularly brilliant or that they'd make for a great film. I don't make movies, I just watch them sometimes. But I do think they're a bit more inspired than the rather limp Thunderball remake we did get. And if ever there were a year a weird James Bond experiment could really stand out, it was 1983. Most Bond movies tend to hew towards the middle quality-wise, but none more so than Octopussy. The film has some fun stunts and action set pieces, but it's also easily one of the most milquetoast, formulaic, and generally middling of the franchise. I can't imagine this is anyone's favorite Bond movie, and it's exactly the kind of film a wild and unique offshoot could have excelled against. This could have been a case where McClory's bizarre rights to the series resulted in a singular experience the main franchise could never offer. And that's what makes Never Say Never Again a waste. We currently live in an age where film IPs are more valued than movie stars or directors, and consequently, intensely managed and protected to preserve brand integrity. But in 1983, a group of filmmakers were given the chance to take their own stab at one of the most iconic and defining cinematic heroes. To make a film outside of the franchise, and outside of the weight and expectations franchise filmmaking imposes. And all they could think to make was a worse version of a movie from 20 years ago.